ministry as a little girl when I was like 14 and God called me into ministry, this is what I saw. This is what I saw. That he would take me to this place. This was the caliber that I've been praying for. And it truly is the highlight of any moments in ministry I've had. And um, I do not take it lightly. And I am grateful that the Holy Spirit would trust me with your life. And you know, there's such an accountability to that. So right now, I just want you to close your eyes for a moment. Mm, Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. You're already on the inside of us. We're not trying to gain you and get you. You live in me. You live in us. You dwell and abide and you stir like a river on the inside of our core of our being. May there be sweet Holy Spirit a currency of you. A river of life that will pour out like never before upon your church. Flood out all the demonic entities and schemes of the enemy. Drown them now in the name of Jesus. You are not allowed here, Satan. You have no power. You have no authority. You've been stripped of it. Holy Spirit. He says in your word that you come alongside of us. And I find that so interesting because you're the Holy Spirit. You could always be ahead of me, controlling, ruling, because you got that kind of power, but yet you choose to come alongside. What a humble man you are. That you see me like you see Jesus. <laughs> and that you put... Your power in me and in us like you did him. And that we could do greater exploits than even he did. May we do them. We're ready. Are you ready? Amen. He's waiting on a church to be ready that he can flow through and pour on, pour out. He's not scary. He's marvelous, he's magnificent, innocent. And I do believe that there's a side of him that we've yet to see. And I want to see that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, since we are in Priceless, um, I'm going to kind of do a continuation on Bright. And... Um, at the beginning, men, don't worry, it might come a little cross as women-ish, but this is a women's conference. And we've been telling Pastor Tim that all weekend when we want our way, it's a women's conference. <laughs> Let me tell you really quick before I get into this, let's just relax a moment. Last year when I came, the only reason I got to come and hear this you know, God uses people. God uses people. So does the enemy, as you probably have had that experience in your life. <laughs> but God uses people. And, and yes, God brought me here. But it took somebody to be sensitive to that. It took somebody to bring up my name as he brought up my name to them. And years and years ago, when I was a teenager, young, before I was married, I met. Miss Jadine. In Arkansas, we have the same mentor. We have the same spiritual mama, Hedy Lou Brooks. I am who I am because of Hedy Lou Brooks. And I sat under her ministry from the age of 14 and or actually third grade. And so that's why I'm here. But then that's where our paths cross. And so I'm setting you up here. There's a reason I'm saying this. And so it's all about kingdom connection. It's all about God connections. To imagine that I'm almost 50 years old and I met her when I was a teenager. 
and that she knew there was a call on my life. What's amazing, she had never heard me preach. And then she comes here. God tells her to leave there. God tells her to obey. And she comes here. And she obeys. And then about, she mentions my name to Miss Angela. And about then eight years later, Angela obeys and says, I think we're supposed to have Cammie come in and preach. I'm going somewhere with this. Listen. And so because of Jadine's obedience coming here and because of Angela's obedience having me come here, then while I was here, God told me last year to bring my daughter. He said to me, I have something for Sienna. I want you to take her to the Priceless Conference. She was a senior in high school, had to pull her out of school. I'm like, okay, God thought there'd be a great prophetic word spoken over her. And then lo and behold, on Sunday, I just really connect with this family called the Savages. And they are savage. And I'm telling you, I love their accent. I didn't even know they had this young man, this boy named Josh. And all of a sudden, I see this man named Josh on the stage. Pastor Mark comes to me. I'm supposed to meet you. I'm supposed, my family's supposed to meet you. Now, Pastor Mark and their family obeyed and moved from England to here. Are you seeing where I'm going? And so when this Josh kid walks off the stage, I'm still under this anointing, and I go like this, and I almost said from the Lord, you're my son-in-law. And I thought, oh, dear God. <laughs> I, I did not say that. I totally came up with something. I, I, can't, I don't even know. God forgive me for lying. But so I'm like, oh, God. I mean, it, it threw me back. We get in the car. And I tell J.D., I'm, I'm, I'm like almost hyperventilating. I've met my future son-in-law. So I, I grabbed Sienna. I said, there's something I've got to tell you when we get, get back to the hotel. She goes, Mom, there's something I have to tell you. I said, okay. <laughs> okay, so she, we get back to the hotel. She said, Mom, you know when the, the savage people, like, and you called me, you called me over. <laughs> she goes, you called me over and said, come, come meet this family. You're not going to believe this, Mom. So while you were praying over people, I saw this kid on the other side of the auditorium in a silhouette. I didn't even see his face. And God said, that's your husband. I said, no, Sienna, you're not going to believe this. I said, because when I'm down there, I said, you're going to be my son-in-law. She goes, oh, dear God, you didn't say that. And I said, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> and I said, but Sienna... Honey, he didn't even look at you. Like, he didn't even really, like, I don't know if he thinks you're even cute. She goes, I know, and that's why I'm drawn to him. He's not that kind of guy. So, we stole Josh from y'all. I'm so sorry. Hey, if they're coming here, we're coming too. <laughs> That is not, Lord, that cannot be a prophetic word right there. <laughs> okay, we're going to reel it back in. I just got a little caught off guard. All right, I am going to talk about, at the beginning, two women who were very bright. One woman in the biblical days, she was bright in a certain way. And there was another woman that you've probably heard of, and you will see here in a minute. And she was bright in a worldly way. You know, there's two different brights. You can be bright in the world, get the attention on you, be bright for you. Because that's the kind of culture we live in. We live in a very self-centered culture, which is the spirit of Lucifer. Because he wanted all the attention. And so here he is again, trying to be bright, come as of light, shine the light on you. It's all about you. And then we forget about the Holy Spirit. And so, anyway, before I talk about them, I want to say this, and it's just a prophetic word that I wrote down last night. I've noticed something throughout this weekend about you, and that is this, something that I have observed. I'm a watcher, and I will stare at you. I'm sorry if I freak you out, but that's just the way the Holy Spirit moves through me. And what I have observed and learned is that you are a soul survivor. 
I'm going to talk on the soul today. Because we've had a lot of bright moments in the spirit. But to maintain that, you've got to keep your soul right. The soul has to be cured. Are you hearing this? We are three-part being. Okay? But here's what I noticed is that you are a soul survivor. Your soul has survived many things. Your soul has survived tragedy. Your soul has survived trauma. Some of you in your soul, you have survived betrayal, grief. I really felt that strong. You're a survivor of grief. In your soul, you have suffered many things. So you're a survivor. But here's what I've learned in my personal life. That even though I survive something, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm over it. Now really hear this. Just because you got through it doesn't mean you're over it. You got through, but has your soul gotten over what you've been through? And obviously I don't think so because I have a prophetic word that he wrote for you. Are you over it in your soul? Now you're sitting here, but are you over it in here? In your emotions, in your will, in your thoughts? Because it's one thing to get through it, it's another thing to be over it. Until you're over it in your soul, you cannot move forward into the next place, the next space, the next level that God has for you. And you will be stuck with a root. Now hear this. Even as a minister, I'm going to be real with you. I'm standing before you ministering what we've been through as a family the past two years. I've gotten through it or I wouldn't be here. But I'm still getting over it. I'm not over it. I, I can admit that to you. I, if you were to ask me, how are you doing? I'm processing. My soul is processing what we've been through. And I don't understand sometimes as Christians, we don't allow our soul to process. Or we think because we're processing something, well, you're not delivered and you're not free and you're not over it. No, I'm processing and, you know, healing sometimes comes off in layers. It's a process, okay? Even throughout the Word, there were prophets and teachers and men and women who, oh, they got through great things and bad things. Just because they got through it doesn't mean they were over it. It took them a while. I mean, if you look at David, committed adultery. He got through the adultery, but he couldn't get over the baby dying. And he's face down. Can't even eat, in de depression, and then asking God to forgive him. You know, even Hannah in the Bible, oh, she got through year after year praying for that baby. Can I just be honest with you? And then there came a moment, I'm not over this. I can't get over the fact, God, that you won't give me what I've prayed for. And it says that she became bitter of soul. And I'm going to tell you something. When you have been standing and contending and praying and believing and declaring and decreeing and you ain't seeing, oh, it'll make you better of soul. Especially when other people get what you've been praying for. And they ain't half the person you are. Can we be real? Don't tell me you ain't thought it because I know I have. I'm telling you right now, when you're processing in your soul, you better stay off of social media because you will get bitter. I'll tell you what, I will compare myself on that thing. Are you kidding me? They got to do that? They're living like hell. Explain that to me, God. I mean, this is just real. You know, even the prophet Elijah, the dude, got through the season of Jezebel. Woo, he escaped her physically, but mentally, he could not get over her threat. In his soul, he was disturbed. So much to the point, he's running, sitting under a broom tree, praying that he would die. Literally, he had a nervous breakdown. Oh, physically, though, he made it. 
in his soul he wasn't making it. Now, are you hearing this? Even Jesus himself, oh, he got through the Mount of Olives. But then there was a moment. I, I, I can't get over what's ahead of me. May this cup pass from me. It says this in Mark 14, 33, 34. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. This is Jesus. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever been so distraught in your soul you want to die? Because that's who I'm talking to today. You know, if you think about Moses, now hear this in the spirit. It was his responsibility to get the Israelites through the Red Sea. But it was not his responsibility to take over the enemy. God did that. It is your responsibility through prayer and faith to believe, to get you through the storm and the trial, but only God can get you over it. And there comes a point where we are trying to get over this on our own, in our own strength, my own might, my own power, and you can't, says the Lord. It's only by my spirit can you get over where you've been and what's happened to you. Stop trying to get over it in your own strength, in your own soul. I think so many times we're trying to get healed and cured, and I'm all about therapy and counseling. I'm all for it. I need one. Find me one. I'll go and sit down and talk. It's great. But I think sometimes when it comes to our healing, we're always looking for it out here. When he's in here, he lives in you. He is the best soul care there is. You won't get it through an altar. You won't get it through a message. Not over it anyway. You'll get, you'll get through by being encouraged. But are you hearing this? Look to him. He lives in you. He lives in you. I'm, I'm, we're fixing to watch this video I mentioned about the two women were very bright in their own different way, a worldly way that our culture, I'm not downing what you're about to see, I'm just showing you an example of a modern day bright and a worldly now bright. If we'll show that video and then we'll get started or continue. The crown traditionally represents power, legitimacy, victory, triumph, honor, glory as well as immortality, righteousness, and resurrection. Because of fear, I had forfeited strength, life, and beauty. I had lost a sense of my true self. And with that loss, so much of what God wanted for me was yet unrealized. I didn't realize I was called. I didn't realize I was chosen. I didn't realize I was born for such a time this. I was born for such a time as this. I didn't realize. You should see me in a crowd. I'm gonna run this nothing to hell. Watch me make them bow. One by, one by, one, one by, one by. You should see me in a crowd. Your silence is my favorite sound. Watch me make them bow. One by, You should see me in a crowd I'm gonna run, there's nothing to hell Watch me make them bow One by, one by, one One by, one by You should see me in a crowd Your silence is my favorite sound Watch me make them bow One by, one by, one One by, one by Nothing to hell. Watch me make them bow One by, one by, one One by, one by You should see me in a crowd Your silence is my favorite sound Watch me make them bow One by, one by, one One by, one by, one 
in that video, you saw two queens who were represented, a modern-day queen and a biblical queen, and these two queens had a lot in common. Both wore a crown. Both had titles. Both were elected. One was chosen. They both lived a royal lifestyle for a whole year. One queen lived in the penthouse in New York City, while the other queen lived with a king in a palace. But now here's where something went wrong. One queen took her life in front of her nation, while the other queen risked her life for her nation. Over two months ago, former Miss USA, who you saw in that video, committed suicide due to mental illness and a soul issue. And it looked as if she had it all. She had the name, fame. She had over a million followers on Instagram. She was a lawyer, entrepreneur. Two weeks before jumping from her penthouse in New York City, she had just interviewed Denzel Washington. So what went wrong? She wasn't over something in her soul. She had a lot of self-care, but she lacked some soul care. The other queen was investing into the soul. Are you hearing this? Yet also was being cared for in self-care. And I want to be honest with you, I'm all about self-care. I believe self-care and soul care work hand in hand when it's prioritized correctly. Because we have to understand God created our temple. We're, his, we're the body. He wants us to take care of it. Okay, so I'm not going to condemn you for self-care. Your skin alone is the biggest organ you got. Take care of it. But hear this. But if you're using it to heal your soul, it won't work. It's only a temporary fix that will soon fade away. And then you need another fix. And you need another fix because your soul ain't fixed. And see, I speak from experience because there was a time in my life I was using self-care to cure my soul. It was amazing because the more I spent on myself, the worse my soul became. And here I was using self-care to overcompensate a soul issue that I was avoiding, ignoring, wouldn't acknowledge or confront. There's no amount of workouts, there's no amount of houses, there's no amount of money and cars, massages, lashes, implants that can cure your soul. And I feel for some of you, your soul needs to be cured. You need to be cured from that divorce. You need to be cured from the season you just came out of. You need to be cured from the PTSD and the trauma. You need to be cured of when you hear certain sounds and you get triggered and your soul shuts down. Come on. For there to be a harvest, you know what a farmer will do? He will cure the soil so that that seed can take root and produce fruit. With a certain treatment though. See, there's a certain treatment that every farmer will use on soil to get what they need to get from it. Hear me, I know we preach a lot, it's fruit, it's all about the fruit, and it is. But it's not a fruit problem, it's a root problem. Because when you get the roots right, you get the fruit right. So if you got people around you ain't got fruit, they got a wrong root. And they need to be cured in their soul because roots take place in the soul. We, we hear this all the time. we got to cut those soul ties. You do. Because they will pull you down. Hear that. We live in a society with all of these treatments. And we're trying to treat our soul. Dear Lord, I mean, if you, if you need to lose weight, there's a treatment out there. If you've got wrinkles on your face, there's a treatment out there. If you need to, to be in a relationship, there's a date app. There's treatments out there. Are you hearing this? You, you know, the woman with the issue of blood, it says this in the Passion Translation, that she used all of these treatments, went to all of these doctors, spent all of this money on all of these treatments, but yet she grew worse. Instead of getting better. Can I be honest? Because treating it won't heal it. Treating it won't free it. Treating it won't cure it. 
Are you treating it? God never called you to treat it. He wants you to be delivered of it. He wants you to be healed of it. And so today I'm going to give you a certain treatment that was used on Esther that cured her soul. And you may hear that and think, really? Esther didn't need to be cured? <laughs> you got to understand, when she was chosen as queen, she still had a mentality of an orphan. She was an orphan when she was chosen. And so you get these handmaidens, and they use this certain treatment on her, and it began to prepare her. And they used it for six months to a year. And so, yes, it treated her outwardly, but it also treated her inwardly because of this certain treatment that I'm going to talk about. And it was bright. And you know, when, 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 he, when we hear this, why would she have to even be treated? Because here she's got Mordecai in the background, who he loved her. Man, he raised her as his own. It's her cousin. Adopted her. But now that she's in the palace, you know what he's telling her? Don't you tell anybody who you are. You keep it a secret. Shh. Don't tell them about your family background. Don't tell them what happened to you. Don't let them know. Don't let them know who you are. Keep it a secret. I'm going to tell you something. It weighed on her soul. Esther 2.10 says this, Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. In verse 19, when the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the gate, but Esther had kept secret about her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to. And you know, the key word that really jumped off at me as I was reading that she kept secret about her family background. I think a lot of us sit here and our soul is sick because we're keeping a secret. And it's weighing on you. And it could be you've been keeping a secret about a family member or a family background situation. And you've kept it all these years, and you've really kept it well. It's not really affected you till now. Because there comes a point, you can keep it in your soul and keep it a secret, and then you're going to have to deal with it. Are you hearing this? And any time my soul is affected, it will affect every aspect of my life. It will affect the ministry. It will affect my marriage. It will affect my parenting. It will affect my health. You do know health issues is linked to the soul. Mm -hmm. It'll affect your vision. Esther was affected because she kept silent about who she was, where she came from, and what happened to her as a little girl. And it weighed her down. Hear that. And you got to understand, Mordecai, his whole motive, his whole intent was to protect her. But instead, it weighed on her. I think for some of you, you're trying to protect yourself or someone else. You're carrying a secret you were never bare to care for. It's weighing you down. That's why I believe that Esther came to that point. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can follow through with this. I, I don't know if I can do this. I, I don't know. And when Mordecai comes to her, if you don't, someone else will. You see, she was carrying this thing. If they find out who I am. Are you hearing this? All of a sudden though, something began to shift in Esther. Something began to happen in Esther. When this certain treatment was applied to her. And in my opinion, this certain treatment is the best soul care there is. In fact, I've been using it for seven years. And this very treatment that I'm about to tell you about, I apply it to my skin every day. There's not a day that goes by that I don't apply this to my skin. And because of this certain treatment, it has cured me of all anxiety, panic attacks, nervous breakdown that I was begging my husband seven years ago to put me in a ward. My life has been radically changed because of this certain treatment. 
And this is what's going to help you maintain what God has done in here this weekend. Okay? With this certain treatment. So Esther, let's go to 2, and we're going to go to verse 8 through 12. I'm going to read about this treatment. After the king's order and law were announced, many young women were brought to the fort of Susa. Haggai was put in charge of them. Esther was also taken to the king's palace, and she was put under the control of Haggai. Verse 9, Esther had pleased Haggai. He showed her how happy he was with her. Right away he provided her with beauty, care, treatments, and special food. He appointed seven female attendants to help her, and they were chosen from the king's palace. He moved her and the attendants into the best part of the place where the virgins stayed. Verse 12, here it is. Pay attention, the treatment. Young women had to complete 12 months of beauty care treatments. They used oil of myrrh for six months, and the next six months perfume and makeup. The application and the treatment was oil. For six months, oil was applied to Esther's skin. When I got hit with the mental disorder, anxiety, and all of that, the Holy Spirit said, get out the oil. And I would literally leave my house and go to the lake and sit on a picnic table and apply this oil to my skin. You have to understand the anointing oil is what breaks the yokes of bondage off of you. Some of you are bound in your soul. You are bound in your mind, in your thoughts, in your senses, in your emotion. You are bound. And it's the anointing oil that breaks the bonds of wickedness and breaks the yokes that are trying to choke out the prophecy, the purpose, the future, and the plan that God has for you. Oil is vital. You can't have a vehicle without oil. Why are you trying to operate without it? In the spirit. Hear that. If, if I was to ask, and I won't, how many of you every day apply the anointing oil on your skin? Think about it. There's power in the anointing. It preserves you. It propels you. It protects you. It promotes you. And it will stop that thing that's trying to choke you. It keeps it in distance length from you. It is the anointing oil that will give you your God-given purpose. I firmly believe this. The only reason Esther got to be and fulfill her purpose is because of the anointing oil that the handmaidens were applying to her every day for six months. And they didn't even realize what they were doing. Because you got to understand, when Esther finally got to be intimate with the king, she had been rubbed with this oil. You have to understand the anointing is transferable. And so when they became intimate, that oil that was on her skin rubbed off on his skin. And why do you think after they were intimate, he said to her, what do you want? I'll give you anything. The anointing is a very powerful thing. It's transferable. The anointing will free you, appoint you, anoint you, promote you. Oh, and it will even cause your enemies to turn around and bless you. It's very powerful. Because here's the thing, you can't deny the anointing. You may not like me. There's times I don't like me. But you can't deny the anointing that's on my life. Are you hearing this? So... The anointing oil, it's tangible, it's transferable, it will transform. So, so hear this, not only was the anointing oil healing me and curing me of the anxiety and mental illness or whatever you want to call it, mental health, but it began to heal others that I noticed were dealing with what I was dealing with. Now, you got to hear this. Wherever you're attacked at is where you're anointed at. So here I was being attacked mentally, not realizing that that anointing now will be able to relate and now cure those who had the same bondage I did. Are you getting this? 
So I want you to think about right now, where are you being attacked at? That's where your anointing is at. The enemy was attacking me because there was anointing on me to set the captives free mentally. Are you hearing this? So the anointing oil that was being applied to Esther, now hear this, it wasn't one time. They didn't apply it one time. It says in the word, six months. For six months, it was a process. She did not become a queen immediately. It was a process. It didn't happen overnight. Now hear this, the healing that took place in my life, the first time that I applied that anointing oil, I was not cured. I didn't feel nothing. I think there's such a misconception of those of you, don't let the enemy lie to you, that you came down here and God anointed you, and he did, and he started the work. But I don't finish that work. The anointing finishes that work. And sometimes we come down, we come forward, we get anointed, but I ain't, I ain't changed, so it didn't work. No, you got to work it. Now it's on you to continue the pattern of the application and the demonstration of the anointing oil. I cannot anoint you every day, but you can. Hear this. It was a process I went through before I received my healing. You got to understand, some miracles happen overnight. Sometimes they happen over a process, especially when it's dealing with your soul. It's a process. Don't get frustrated. It's like an onion. It comes off layer by layer by layer. And whoa, can I be honest with you? When you get down to that bottom layer, whoa, burns like hell. That's when you know you're about to be delivered. When you feel the steam. Are you hearing this? I want you to think about where does oil come from? An olive. What, what does an olive have to go through in order to get the oil? It goes through a process. You cannot get oil without a process. And the olive goes through a crushing. Olive goes through a pressing. It says, get this. We don't Google, right? But this is what it says. There's an, an amount, the amount of pressure that an olive goes through to get the oil. It's the same type of pressure that if you were in the uh, plane and wind was hitting that, what am I trying to say? Windshield. That's the same amount of pressure that an olive goes through to get the oil. That's a lot of pressure. Are you under pressure? See, see, can I be honest? We don't really want to go there in our soul because it's, it's, it's going to apply some pressure. And it's going to be a little painful. And it might crush some areas. See, this is why we're more into self-care. Can I tell you why? We get immediate results. So care you don't always get immediate results. It's a process. See, see here's what's happening. We live in a prime Amazon culture where we want it overnight and we'll pay the extra for it. The kingdom of God doesn't always work that way. And we don't hear a lot of messages on this. I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but it's true. Esther's process wasn't overnight. It took over a year for one night with the king. And I want you to hear this. This process that she went through was behind closed doors in the private. It was a private setting, not a public setting. Oh, there was no audience. There were no likes. There were no followers. There were no views. No one saw this process she went through. Anything that I am publicly has everything to do with who I am in the private time. The only way you're going to be cured in your soul is what you do in the privacy of your home. Behind closed doors, apply that oil, says the Lord. True soul care happens in a private setting. Every time I anoint myself, you'll never see it. It's secret. It's private. It's precious. I'll never forget this. Um, this happened. Well, Sienna Claire was in my belly, and she's about to be 20. This is just an illustration God wanted me to use. But this watch was given to me. 
by a prophetess named Juanita Bynum. And I so loved her. And my daddy had been asked to be interviewed on TBN. And I went because she was there. She was going to be interviewed. And I was pregnant with Sienna. All I wanted to do was meet the woman. I mean, she was in the prime of her anointing. And uh, sure enough, she crossed me and looked. And she had bangle bracelets on. And she handed me the bangle bracelets and she said, Will you hold these while I'm up there preaching? They make noise. And I'm like, oh, yes, I will. I mean, I took those bracelets and I put them on Sienna. And I'm putting them on me and thinking, oh, the anointing. You know what I mean? I was so immature. I still am. But anyway. Well, so then she comes back. And we're in the green room. And she, uh, I give her back her bracelet. She goes, oh, thank you. I forgot about those. And she goes, what do you want? And I said, I, I'll be honest with you. I came because of you. I want the kind of anointing you have. She goes, you do? I said, yeah. She goes, there's a price to be paid for it. She goes, oil ain't cheap. My oil didn't come cheap. You willing to pay it? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I mean, I had this big old watch on. I said, you know how much I, I love watching you? I even bought a big watch at Walmart like your watch. And she did this. She looked up and she goes, oh, dear God, I just bought that watch. And she took it off. And she said, "Uh, it is your time for ministry. Now, Sienna's 20. I'm just now coming into that time. It's a process. Oh, there's more to the story. So I begin to wear this watch. I had no idea what a Cartier was. It's a Cartier. And all of a sudden, the watch is working. I'm loving it. It's it's awesome. But then all of a sudden, it quits working. I mean, it's not keeping time. It's working, but it's not keeping the right time. So I'll go to the jewelry store. I said, sir, I need a new battery for this Cartier. And he laughed at me. He said, well, ma'am, there is no battery. It operates by your motion. I said, yeah, but now it's not keeping time. He goes, well, there's a reason for that. On the back of the watch are valves that have oil in them. So when that oil runs dry, it will not keep the right time. So this watch operates with your motion and oil. They got to work hand in hand. You can't just wear it and not have oil in it or it won't work. And then I said, well, absolutely, Linda. let's put some oil in that bad baby. And he said, okay, well, that'll be $1,200. I was like, dear God, I could buy 10 watches. With tw- I said, $1,200 for just oil? He said, oh, ma'am, that kind of oil ain't cheap. And I said, oh, I'm not paying that. That thing still ain't keeping the right time. My point is this, for a year, it kept time. But you know what? There comes a point I can't rely on Juanita Bynum's oil. I got to get my own oil. It cost her something, and I got to ride on it for a year. And then, up to you, big girl. Are you hearing this? So here's what it says about the anointing. Is it really worth the price? It is. It says this in Isaiah 58, 6. The anointing will undo the bonds of wickedness, tear to pieces the ropes of the yoke, and let the oppressed go free and break apart every enslaving yoke. Anoint yourself. It's worth it. Hear that. It says this in Leviticus 26, 13. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so you would no longer be their slaves. I broke the yoke of slavery from your neck so you can walk with your heads held high. What is a yoke? It is a form of bondage. A yoke is a symbolization of slavery. This is what the farmers would use back in the day, and they would put a yoke upon an oxen. Isn't it amazing? Last year I talked about a, you know what, a donkey. 
The donkey had another name. I won't say it. But what the farmer would do, the farmer would put this yoke on the oxen's neck. And you know what? At the beginning, the oxen, no big deal. He had the strength. He had the endurance. He felt comfortable in the yoke. But as the day goes by, all of a sudden, the oxen cannot even hold up his head. To where now he's accepted the yoke because he has no strength to fight it. Are you hearing this? See, the yoke's intent is to keep his head down. To see where he is instead of where he's going. And the enemy is using a yoke on you to keep you looking at where you've been, what's happened to you, instead of what God has for you. Hear this. It says this in Isaiah 10, 27. And it shall come to pass that his burden shall be taken away from off of your shoulder and his yoke from off of your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of what? The anointing. Whew. It's even hit me in the face. Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine 29 says this, and this is Jesus talking. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For what? Listen to this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. And in heart, I am humble. And you will find rest for your what? Souls. For my burden is easy and my yoke is is light. Bright comes from light. The way we stay bright is with the anointing oil. And when you begin to apply it to your life, the burden, you begin to take on God's burden, and His burden is easy, and His yoke is light. How do we take on God's yoke? You got to get, un you got to be unyoked with some things. And some of us in here, we always hear that as parents, don't be unequally yoked, and we think of our sinner teenagers. That there are some of us who are yoked up with things that we should not be yoked up with. And it's unequal. It's unequal. And you keep that unequal yoke on you and you'll never get yoked up with the Lord's yoke. Are you hearing that? I want to say this. Did you know a farmer will never put two oxen of the same age in a yoke together? You know why? Because they compete and they fight and they want to do things in their own way, in their own direction. They want to go their own direction. So the farmer knows, i got to put a young one with an old one. Some of you right now are yoked up with something that it's a same familiar spirit. It's making you go in the wrong direction. Or you're not going any direction at all. What is competing for your soul? It's not worth it because what you're anointed for will be so ten times greater than what's competing for your soul. You got blogs on the inside of you. You got Bible studies on the inside of you. You got to preach on the inside of you. Don't be distracted by the enemy's yoke on you. Where are we at? I love this ending, and I'm done when finally Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Don't forget why you're here. It ain't about you. It ain't about the crown. It ain't about all these treatments. You've been treated this way now for a certain reason, for your nation. Some of you have not been treated the best. She wasn't treated the best. She lost her mom and dad. She was abandoned. She was orphaned. What I've learned is those that aren't treated well get the best treatment from the Lord. He chooses you. He never chooses those who are qualified. He chooses you. He chooses you, honey. He chooses you. Holy Spirit, fall in this place like you already are and have your way. Have your way. 
pour your spirit out. Miss Rochelle, I only want you, because there's a reason for this, if you'll come forward. I don't know yet. Hold on. Pour your spirit out. The Holy Spirit has shown me to do something very specific. And I've actually never done this in ministry before. We had a lot of healing. We had a lot of deliverance. Let her just, you let it out, sister. Get it out. Let God get it out of you, sweet girl. Honey, if you'll bring the anointing oil in. I told Manny this, that last night I'm like, okay, is there direction for the altar call? And um, this weekend was powerful. You women came. You got set free. You got anointed. Man, it was beautiful. Um, but today we're going to do something a little different. And I want, if we can, I want to get those two chairs. Um, if, sir, if you don't mind, I just want you to set the two chairs, let's, I guess, right here, please. Thank you. And you can just face them, face me, turn them and face me. Thank you, sir. And you can put them together. I really felt this strong that, you know, in, in ministry, pastors are always giving out. We're always giving out. We're always giving out. We're always pouring out. And we love that. That's what we're chosen for. Then there's just moments where we need to get poured into. And you know what? Can I be honest with you? We come from a church that I can go to my flock. I have that core that I can go to them and say, I'm hurting. I'm not right. And they have been there for me more than anybody else. You are the sheep of this house. Without you, we would have no flock. And you, when you begin to pray over your pastors and your leadership, that's when revival will take place. Because there's nobody that can pray like you can. And what I want to do now, what the Holy Spirit showed me to do, I love you, I'd give anything to pray over you, but that's not what I'm called to do today. Today, I want Pastor Tim and Pastor Angela to come sit. I want the rest, I only have her up here. If you're on the praise team, I want you to come and make a dome. If you are any type of um, staff, any type of leadership, you know who you are. Teachers, um, I might have the whole church down here. <laughs> um, secretary, leaders, the ones that come down and you pray over us all the time. I want you to come. And I just want y'all to make a dome because Manny and I are going to anoint you today. We are going to anoint you. And if you'll just spread out because I love structure and order and I want Miss Nolene to come up, please. And Manny and I, we want to anoint you. For you, I'm going to let everybody get down here and I don't I want to miss anybody. So, I mean, like, please don't sit there in humility and miss it down here. <laughs> so if you need to be up here, you know who you are. Uh, the media team. I know that I have... Uh, three songs to play and I may play them but I want you to be down here we're going to let Miss Rochelle do this camera people okay we're going to minister to you we're going to anoint you not because of who we are but because of who he is and that's just scriptural to do amen J.D., I want to start with you. Praise God.
For the Lord says to you, my daughter, my child, none of this would take place if it wasn't for your obedience and your willingness and your sacrifice. For you planted a seed and you had no idea that it would create a harvest and a crop that would be plentiful. That it would draw in nations and it would draw in wedding and it would draw in mantles and it would draw in increase. And I honor you today. For you were listening and sensitive to me. You had no idea the impact you have created and you have made indeed. For my anointing is increasing on you, my daughter. And in the same way in Esther, when the king said, what do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. For the Lord says to you, my daughter, what do you want? For I have been preparing you, for you do so much behind the scenes, in the background, in the private, that no one sees. What do you want? Just tell me, says God. To think if we don't obey, what, what if you would have left? What if you would have quit? What if you wouldn't got, got mad? Y'all better hear that. What if she would have got angry two years ago or five years ago and left and I never got here? Maybe my little girl would have never met her mate. Are you getting this? I'm telling you right now, you might be butt hurt, but get your butt right. Can I be real with you? Because God has promotion for you in this house and Satan wants to take you out. And it is connected to your lineage. It is connected to your harvest. It is connected to your destiny. Don't you leave if you're mad. Don't you leave if you're bitter. Don't you leave if you're offended. That ain't of God. Oh, I can't believe you said butthurt in the church. Come on. We got to kick that religious cow. I'm trying to get a point across to you that the enemy is trying to lie to you and confuse you and to take you out because of what God has for you. And I'm saying to you, you better bring them in from the north, south, east, and west. Because when you do what I've done for this one, I'll do for you, says the Lord. I want all of y'all that are standing around now, I want you to put stretch your hands out to this couple. Have anything throughout this thing, babe? Oh, landa and no lean. We're just gonna flow. Ye mahashe kamahashe kana mahase. Ro londo e hamahale. Ro no hole e amahaye. Ro mahase e mohosi. Father God, in the same way that we are standing around this mighty, powerful couple right now, I thank you for station ministering, warring angels that are guarding them, protecting them. I just want everyone that is with your hands out, I want you to make a fist. For right now, the sword of the Spirit is out, says the Lord. All angels' swords are out, says the Lord. And they are cutting every device and scheme and ploy of the enemy. For right now, the sword of the Spirit is decapitating every plan and strategy of the enemy. And they cannot get, he cannot get, he cannot get, and he won't get 10 feet from you, says the Lord. For right now, we place a restraining order against the enemy. No weapon formed against this family. No weapon formed against Jubilee will prosper. In the name of Jesus, Father God, I thank you and I praise you. I remove word curses right now. The Bible says that any word that rises against you, I shall condemn. And I praise you and I thank you right now that those word curses will no longer curse them, no longer come at them. I remove them now in the name of Jesus rumors, slander, vicious, violent, Jezebel spirit of jealousy. I renounce you now. I praise you and I thank you that Father God, there was a vision that your daddy had and you will fulfill that vision, says the Lord. I have appointed you and I have anointed you and I have groomed you and I have carved you out and you will be mighty in me, says God. 
miracles and signs and wonders will come through Jubilee. The enhancement of increase of finances will pour. The windows of heaven is opening out, says the Lord. For deep cries out to deep. Deep cries out to deep. Deep cries out to deep. You've been hurt deep. But now you will go to the depths with me and you will see that which you've always desired to see. Just believe. Just believe. Father, I thank you that your anointing oil right now is breaking any yoke of bondage. I command in the name of Jesus, no familiar spirit of infirmity will ever come back upon this woman. I thank you that she is a miracle and she, Father God, will maintain that miracle because you, O oh God, do not take away miracles. I praise you and I thank you, Lord, for the enhancement, the strength, O oh God, the courage, O oh God, the dedication, oh God, and the humbleness that this man operates in, a place of humility, a place of honor, to pastor, to be the shepherd of the house. And he's anointed like never before for it. In Jesus' name. Okay, I do need someone in the sound. I just, I feel for this right now. There is a specific song, that first song I want you to play just really quick. And, I, and then you can come back down here and just let it play. Because Rochelle, I need you to be down here. That's what the Lord said, anointing. Because you're a pastor's wife. And I know you're supposed to pray for Miss Angela right now. All right, so we're going to turn on this music and we're going to pray. I just want to say this. I know some of you are out there, and I understand if you need to be released and go home, so I don't want you to feel like you've got to stay. But what I do want you to do is I want, if you are going to stay, I want you to pray. You're not being left out. Without this, we could not be. Amen? So will you pray in the Spirit over these people, and we're just going to uh, anoint them. Yeah. Just real quickly, uh, the Lord put a scripture on my heart this morning before we even came, and I didn't really know how, if, if it was going to be spoken forth. And then when Sister Nolene shared about the rivers coming from this house and flowing from this house, and it was Isaiah 43, 19 and 20 that says, Forget the former things, for I am doing a new thing, says the Lord. Behold, do you not see it? And then it went on to say, this is what got me. I will make a way in the wilderness. I will provide a way in the wilderness. And then it says it twice. I got my attention. It says it twice. Rivers in the desert. Rivers in the desert. Do not dismiss your desert season. This is for these leaders here, but it, it, the anointing flows from the head down. So this is for you guys. God is pleased because you've not dismissed your desert season. Because it's only in the desert season where you see my river flowing in that desert time. And the river is symbolic of the Spirit of God flowing. And what I love about a river, there is a current, there is a flow. There is a current and a flow. And this is what I saw for you, Pastor Tim and Miss Angela. All you got to do is get into the river and let the river flow through. It'll be the river flowing, not you. All you do is get in where the river is. You, you have a heart to just get where, you just want to get my people where, where you are. You just want to get the church where the spirit of God is. And I felt that strongly. That's what I love. I see it in the spirit as you just step into the water, step into the spirit in this new season. He tells you, you're just going to enjoy the ride because you're going to flow on his current. It'll be his words, his anointing, his power coming out of you even to a greater degree. And I just declare it over the leadership, over the house, over the leaders, over those of you sitting in your seats. Do not dismiss your desert season because that is where you will find the flow, the spirit of God flowing. Sometimes, this is where Cam and I have been. We have been in the worst season of our life. But I'm thankful that we are finding the worst season oftentimes gives birth to your best season. And I've come to tell you we're not in that place anymore. We are in our best season because of the flow. Just stepping into the spirit of God and allowing him to lead us and direct us and guide us. So can we give God praise for that right there? That's for you. Come on. It's the flow of God, the spirit, the river of God flowing in this house, and it flows from this house. Amen.
Amen. And I just want to add to that. That tsunami that tried to take this house out, God said, you're now on top of that thing. You're going to ride that thing out. See yourself like a surfer in the spirit. That thing is to excel you and fly high, says God. You're going to ride it. It ain't going to take you out. You're going to ride it. Okay, we're going to pray. Let's start that video, please, sweetheart. And we got the three, and we're just going to anoint y'all. Let's just love. Once you get anointed, anoint someone else around you. Amen? And you can turn it up, please.